want to hit younger people so younger people know sooner. This is not new. Not having kids is not new, either by choice not or, or not, or anything in between. You know, the women in this book there, a lot of them, I mean, I don't even go into the reasons why, because they're busy living amazing lives, you know, it's, it's not all fun. Welcome to the Child Free Wealth Podcast, hosted by Bree and Dr. J, Certified Financial Planner. Here we discuss life and finances as it relates to being child free. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Please consult your advisor before implementing any ideas heard on this podcast. Hey, Child Free Wealth listeners, something a little different here. We have one of the OGs, the original people that I swear I bow down her. She's been doing this child free stuff forever. We're not going to talk exact years because, you know, that might age people. But Laura Carroll is here, and you might have seen her stuff. She's done a whole lot of books and publications, and Baby Matrix is probably one of the more popular ones, Family of Two. New book coming out, A Special Sisterhood. So I've got her here. We're going to talk about her new book. We're going to talk about History of Child Free. And one of the ones Laura and I have been kind of bashing around is kind of like, how do we actually market to Child Free and get it, you know, allow other people to do it? So we're going to, like, go a whole bunch of topics. But Laura, happy to have you here. Kind of introduce yourself and, you know, maybe I missed something there. I think you covered it. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me on. It's, it's going to be fun, I can tell. <laughs> yes, I have been doing it a while, done some books. And uh, yeah, when I published Families of Two in the year 2000, it got so much reception and it told me uh, that I was on to something. And yes, I was. So here we are over 20 years later and I'm still yakking about it. <laughs> And helping people, others, other people, you know, as well. So I like that. And I was reading, there was a statement in the Baby Matrix, I think it was. You're like, well, 2010 or 11 was the year of the child free or something like that. It seems like every decade there's kind of like a year of, or a reason why we're special this year. And I don't know, this year it's probably politics and the recent posts on dinks and other things. But kind of like, give people a little background. Because you've been in this child free community for ever you know, many decades at least. What's the biggest change you've seen? Boy, I think the biggest change in the last 20 years, at least when I've been doing this a little over 20, is just the the amount of exposure. When I was interviewing couples for families of two, there, there was no Google. The, the internet was just this funky thing that everybody hated because they didn't know how to use it. It was real new. I had to find people by advertising in papers, magazines, and then they, they would respond and they would leave a message on my answering machine. <laughs> we have some audience here that has no clue what that is, but all right, I know, I know so I'm following you. As the internet really exploded, I just saw the amount of uh, information, exposure of child-free people, who we are, educate people about that, and almost most importantly, we helped us find community, helped us find each other. Before the explosion of the internet, it was really tough to do, and I heard that a lot from couples I was interviewing for families of two, and so th this has been one of the biggest things, and then of course that's led to a lot of great positive things, and then there's also been some not so positive things that, you know, that because the social media can be exaggerated and inaccurate, so there's everything going on all at once, but I'm still, I land with it's all good because it's now so much bigger and it gets bigger all the, every year. It's, uh, it's a good, good trend overall. When did you start using the word child-free versus some of the other terms that are out there for the community? You know, uh, for families of two, I was, editors <laughs> suggested we say, uh, you know, couples without children by choice. But I was using child free in my communications at that time and, and since, and it was the first time it was used, it was in a textbook, you know, it was in the 70s. Some scholar came up with it as a way to capture people who chose not to have children. So that's why it's, I think, stuck. It's easy. It's one word. We can certainly riff on, is it the best word? That could be a whole episode, and I've talked about that. <laughs> but that's one reason I continue to use it. It's, it's something that you can use quickly, algorithmically it works, etc. And you use it without the dash, right? I use it without the dash. That's correct. And I've seen it that more use now with the dash as it's a person who just happens to be without children right now. 
It could be someone who wants kids but isn't, doesn't have them now or in a situation where you don't have them right now. But overall, with the dash, without the dash, two words, child-free, by choice, it's all muddled. So, yeah, I, I bark about that a lot. <laughs> oh, there, there's a paper, I don't know if you saw it, the, the two Dr. Neal who did the Michigan study on child-free population. Yes, I did. just put out one on how to ask research questions around the term child-free. And it was a really interesting history in there of how it comes. You know, I'm, a, I'm a research nerd, so cool. And they were talking about the term voluntary childlessness about being a social evil. And I had this moment because I was reading this paper about the same time that Elon Musk was talking about dinks being a terrible moral choice or something like that. And I'm like, and that first voluntary childless was almost 100 years ago. 100 years and we're still like fighting over is it a good or evil thing? I mean, like... Am I missing? No. I mean, I'm, in, I'm deep in the South, so I get a little bit too much of this. But. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I think that's where you go to the baby matrix because it, it boils down to just pronatalism, a system of beliefs that thinks somehow we're, we should have children. If we don't want them, we're strange. And it goes back many generations. And that's why it's so big and powerful. And that's what I try to delve into in that book is, is why is it so hard for you know society to accept this? And why is it so stubborn anyway? It goes back, it's because it's a behemoth. So it's a social cultural phenom that we're trying to slowly chip away at. And then there are actors like Musk and a lot of this year too, tech people, there's a you know, a neo, I call it neonatalist movement where there's rich tech people who are out there saying, we all have to have as many babies as possible because we need, we're the ones who need to reproduce to keep this economy going. So it, it's just crazy. Yeah. Don't, don't get me started on the ones I, I go, I got a financial podcast. And they'll be like, well, if everybody's child free, the social security will fall apart. I'm like, that's because social security is messed up. That is not because of us. Like the system exactly. has a problem. Yes, exactly. Not us. Right. But, Right. Let's say some days I don't win that battle. Like it's, <laughs> oh, you know, you and I have slightly different audiences who we talk to, and I talk to a lot of financial folks who don't even know child for evil exists. Yeah. And when you first start talking, they're like, "Wait, what? And how many are there?" And all this. And, and the doctors, Neil, they're going to come on a podcast. Uh, I think in January we're recording, and they actually just did a study on the percentage of child free pre and post row overturn. Oh, and the. the you know, there's some interesting data in there. And, and if you look at the data on sterilizations, pre and post row, huge pop up. Yeah, you know, they're, they're definitely up for guys, but uh, women still face, uh, you know, some challenges because if a woman decides to have permanent birth control and get her tubes tied or whatever, doctors don't all, you know, they don't easily go, oh, okay. Yeah, I'll be interested to see, watch what, uh, learn from their research. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed too is I like to look at the age groups and what are the percentages of say that, you know, that I, I, I want to get sterilized or I have gotten sterilized or I don't want kids. But, you know, if it's the 18 to 25 age group, I don't look at that so much as, well, talk to me after they're 30, even better, 40, because that then they were more likely to see, oh, well, they intend not to and they probably aren't going to. Right, so there's a lot of intentionality in the data, um, and that's why I also love longitudinal studies, which is why I did one of my own. It, it, I think it's, it's more work, but it also tells you of a person's life over time and how, they, how that choice can evolve over time or not. So it's interesting stuff. That's fair, by the way, there's huge differences in the way men and women are treated in all of these discussions. I mean, that, I'm just gonna call that out. But all of your research really has been around women. What about the men? Do, do you kind of like, are those not interesting to you? Or are we kind of like, is that somebody else's problem? <laughs> like, you know, I have to say that one time I started collecting, uh, you know, guys that wanted to be interviewed and was wanting to also to focus uh, across countries. So not just the States, Canada and Australia, that type of thing. And it got uh, challenging. It really did. And then, unfortunately, then I got into, uh, you know, the, the baby, I got it turned on to pronatalism or not even turned on. I got into the rabbit hole <laughs> of pronatalism and that really got me more. So it's a, it's a project that sits there. Yes, with some dust, but I do think there's a lot to explore with uh, child free 
men, and I think women are the ones that I guess we get focused on more often because we're the ones that are going to have the baby. Whether you, you know, it's, it, it, I understand it takes two to tango, but that's and it's a traditional thing to say. But that's sort of what drives it. And for myself, I am a woman. I am a child-free woman, so it made sense. But where I started with families of two was with couples and so I talk to lots of guys and you'll hear from them in families of two you real talk from real people so it is out there just not as much yeah we uh for the child free convention we had a child free guys panel and they're like where are the guys and if you look at the data because I work with a lot of child free influencers in different areas and we have our own stuff it is like 89 percent women in in the child free groups online and the influencers like I mean it's huge skewed I don't know I don't know if that's just because Women want more of the community, men don't, or because the content is towards women versus men. I mean, I, I know I know it's not necessarily a research area, but do you have like a gut of why that's the case? It could, one hypothesis could have to do with it, that guys just don't feel the need to discuss it as much. It's just, that's who I am. And I mean, what more is there to talk about if they're feeling like, do they have to connect with other child-free guys? Maybe not. It might just, what the men are, they're interested in and what they're feeling. Certainly, 20 years ago, the guys wanted to find each other because they, there was, again, there was no place online to go. Um, now you can get on and, you know, find stuff so easily. So oh, let's watch and see, you know, someone like you could, could do something like that. I've certainly seen evolving groups of men who want kids who haven't had them. They are collect, you know, finding community, but they have that reason that they're, they're not happy about that. The child-free guys, Seems like they're happy with that. So <laughs> what else is, you know, what else? I mean, I'm sure there are issues to talk about, but uh, I have a feeling it's just, it's that, that there's uh, there's not as much as desire for the, uh, you know, discourse, I suppose. Well, I mean, the pressures are not the same. That's just honest. It, it is not. You know, there's still issues, but it's different. And one of the things you did, Laura, I want to kind of like pull back, go back in the way, way back machine. You brought back International Child Free Day, essentially. You took Non-Parents Day and re-invigorated like invigorated it, let's call it that. Tell me about that and why you did that. I just got real inspired by what uh, was done in the 70s by, they were population organizations at the time, but they were had the same agenda. They wanted to make it more awareness that parenthood is a choice. And when you don't choose it, you can have some really cool lives and they'd have the, you know, the queen and king of the year. And I thought, wow, why don't I try to do that? I'm not gonna do the queen and the king. <laughs> and so I, instead of calling it, you know, non-parents day, I just decided to call it International Child Free Day and try to have it be more of a global thing. We started with Child Free Man and Woman of the Year, and then a few years into it, we just went to Child Free Person and then Child Free Group. And uh, for 10 years, we grew it. It was just all a volunteer effort. And every year, we got better at global uh, nominees. And then, you know, this last couple of years, I saw Child Free Media come on, and they're doing their convention. And I thought, you know, maybe it's time to pass the torch, and uh, now, now it's into its second evolution. I'm curious to see what, what happens next year. <laughs> Yeah, and Cody and Lenore were actually on. We had a discussion about International Child Free Day, and we did a billboard in Times Square. And one of my I favorite, we shared people's great. lives. Yeah, yeah, it was just a little weird. And by the way, interesting side note, worked great from a social media standpoint until great. five o'clock. Uh, somebody got indicted, namely the ex president, oh. on that day. Oh. And all of our engagement for press. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah. Right. Well, those yeah, I know about but, that. Yeah, but being in the media over the years, as soon as another hot story comes, you're, you know, you're off the docket till whatever day. So it's really fickle. So, <laughs> so we focused on a couple different people that shared their stories. And Sabu, who's out, been on the podcast, shared her story. She's a, she's a bit of a nomad, got you know, a cool life wandering. And she had posted it on her Instagram. Hey, I'm on this billboard in Times Square. We're all exciting. And the comment section, like, I still don't, this one sticks in my head. This guy's like, hey, you're part of a globalist conspiracy to depopulate the world and blah, blah. And I'm like, what are you smoking? Like, I mean, like, but that's the reactions we get. For all the, all we were doing was saying, it's child free day, here's our life. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say that's the odds of that kind of response being the most common. I don't think so. 
I just think it's people whose their mindsets are a little more extreme against this whole thing. And most of us land in that normal curve of that's cool, that's fine, whatever, and they don't feel a need to respond. It's a little bit like trolls, you know, online. It's the, the bad actors like to bark, bark, bark. I got it makes you makes me think though, when I first started talking about this in the media, I was on a lot of talk radio. And uh, at the beginning, when after Families of Two came out, I had callers calling in who thought I was, you know, wanted to eliminate the black race and really crazy stuff and so I had to learn fast <laughs> how to really get out of that you know those uh, comments but so it's out there but I think it's uh, something that uh, it's only you know people that have extremer views against it that feel the need to come out and you know yell and scream well I'm going to challenge you a little bit here and I think in current U.S. because that's where we, I do my work in the U.S. I think there's a big difference in where you live and how much, how loud that is and what's going on. I mean, you know, I'm in Tennessee and I was in Mississippi before and the governor there was saying, well, we're not trying to outlaw con contraception yet. Like, it wasn't like, you know, we're not, no, no, it's on the list. We're just not there yet. I actually had big concerns about how to protect my clients' privacy and other things. And, you know, when I went to sell my house, I had to take down my child free signs and stuff because I didn't want anyone to like, you know, do anything to the house or not buy it. Like... It was literally a discussion with the realtor of like, hey, I need to do this. I get you. But then again, sure. there are other areas I, I get, where... Yeah, regionally, I think there are differences. And I, I get what you're saying. Maybe extreme is a little too extreme. Again, I do think when you get that kind of a reaction from someone who's so against it, I, I don't think that's, that's the norm. That's not to say that where you live, you have, you have to think about some things that if you want an end game of sort. But I do think looking at the longer timeline of it, it's a hell of a lot better than it was just two decades ago. I have to say, even in Tennessee. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah, we, it's, it, we, there's still a ways to go for sure, for sure. But uh, the needle has moved, and I'm thrilled to, to have watched it move. Um, and I hope it, it's going to keep going, I know. Yeah, the data says it's being more accepted. It's a larger population. It's growing. Like, I have no doubt about any of that. Um, and I, people always thought, well, the younger generation, who knows? Maybe they'll change their mind. I have no clue. I'm not going to get in the middle of that. But, you know, I've got people from my book, at least, that are getting sterilized at 21. And, like, yep. They're not changing their mind. Like, I mean, you know, this is done. Right. Um, so I right. think I think there is a huge shift. And I, I just, maybe we're on the cusp of like the acceptance component of this. I hope so. I mean, we're certainly, certainly on the road to acceptance. I think I've seen it. Yeah. So I think it's uh, t time. Time tells us a lot. That's why I'm a big fan of longitudinal looks at things. That's fair. And go talk about time. So we got the new book, A Special Sisterhood. And I was flipping through here, and like you go back hundreds of years, you go back to goddesses, you go back to people. Why did you pick a hundred fascinating women from history who never had children to talk about? I mean, this is like this is a little different than what you've done before, but kind of similar. It's a little different. Um, well, I did do a presentation at a conference several years ago, and it was called the Not Mom Summit, and uh, was done. Uh, spearheaded by Karen Malone Wright, who had this idea to get child-free and childless women in the same room, and women with any story in between, in the same room to focus on commonalities um, that we have and build a larger collective. And it was a fabulous idea, I thought. And so I did a, a presentation, 25 minutes or so, and in, on this topic of uh, women from history who didn't have kids no matter what the reason. I learned so fast that there are so many of them. I, I just got overwhelmed about how am I going to do this? So over time, I got inspired to just keep going to where it was hard to keep it to 100, you know, and I tried to do it over time, different countries. And I really feel like for myself in my own journey on this whole child free thing is I do see for it to really progress as a movement, we have to build a larger collective. And in order to make some changes of things we don't like, like there's some workplace policies, a lot of people without children, no matter what the reason, don't like. Some policies that the government puts out, we don't like. I mean, that's more of a meta you know, agenda, but I see that it's in time to focus more on commonalities. And also I wanna hit younger people so younger people know sooner. This is not new. Not having kids is not new either by choice not or, or not, 
or anything in between. You know, the women in this book, there a lot of them, I mean, I don't even go into the reasons why, because they're busy living amazing lives, you know, it's, and it's not all fun. It's not all like, oh my God, she has so many, you know, achievements and yes, there's that, but these are like real lives and stuff that happens to these women and how they deal with it going all the way back to 350 AD. I just felt inspired to, for young, it's really designed for a young adult audience and up. So I, I want to hit people younger uh, to see that this can, your life, your life can unfold in any way you want it to. See, check out these women. <laughs> so that's how I just got inspired to uh, have this be th the next, you know, work in my, you know, series of books I've done on, on this topics related to not having kids. So if you had to pick a favorite one or two out of this book, who would you highlight? I can't pick a fave, Jay. Those, I mean, there's a hundred of them in here. Fifteen chapters. <laughs> yeah, give me a story of one but, or two that, like, you thought was like, you know, here's a cool story, or here's somebody I really looked up to, or. Oh gosh, who comes to mind? There's, uh, I think it was Kathy Williams off the top of my head, and she, she was the first black meat female to serve in the army. I'll give you this one. She figured that she couldn't, I mean, she, she was born into a, a slavery. And during the Civil War, s former slaves were hired to do domestic work, etc., for people in the military. And she did some of that, so, and they paid them. So she learned that she could, you know, she wanted to keep her independence. And after the Civil War was over, people still weren't really hiring blacks. And, and so she just, and a lot of blacks were going into the military, and she decided that she wanted to go into military, only one problem is they didn't allow women to go into the military. So, what, how tall was she? Was, you know, a tall person, 5'9", five, 5'10", five, something like that. She decided to flip her name from Cathay Williams to William Cathay, and she disguised herself as a guy, and she got into the military. <laughs> and they didn't even hey. know she was a woman for two years and she fought, she was in barracks, she did the whole thing. And so only after she got sick and the medical, you know, military med guy went, oh my God, you have breasts. <laughs> and she was honor honor honorably discharged. So it's a story like she did something first, but it was like she want, went after something and she did it, you know, no matter what she was going to get it. There's an example of someone I thought, dang, man, that at the time that took that took some kahunas, you know, it took, took some bravery to do something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know how you picked up 100 because like I, I would it was hard. I would have been the person that like had the book at like 300 and then I like, kept on like doing extra volumes or something like. Well, there might be another, you know, edition of it, but I thought 100 was nice and tight, it was neat. I tried again to have women from different cultures, different eras. Uh, that was my main goal. And I thought, God, if it's more, if it's like 200, it would, the book would be, t be too big, you know, it'd be <laughs> To even to ebook would be like it take too long to download because of all the beautiful illustrations. That too is the first thing I've done, never had done before, is work with an illustrator. And I found one, and uh, she was just fantastic. So uh, I would definitely do that again. And I think that helps make the book not only fun, educational, but beautiful. It's a it's a beautiful work if I do say so myself. She's really talented. Oh yeah, I mean the art is awesome, and I was like flipping through it like. And each chapter has like kind of a header, you know, what we're talking about, you know, writers or whatever. And I like pick up and I'm like, oh, I never heard that story. And then I'm like, oh, no, I've heard that story. And then like you, you, you go back and forth of like who you know versus you don't. And it's a nice little dive in. Well, and there's some, I, for, for a younger audience, I, I know I put some people in that, you know, people that more our age, we've probably heard of the person, but a younger people may not have, or even if we'd heard of them, we, maybe we didn't know that about them. So tried to come in with a few curveballs, even for the older generations. <laughs> well, and we can do a separate book of just like, right now there's a lot of discussion like child-free celebrities. So Chelsea Handler came out and had her whole thing and fighting with Fox and Seth Rogen and Dolly Parton and, and you know, all these other really interesting characters. And I wonder if those, I, I don't want to call them role models because that's doesn't feel right, but those people Mm -hmm. That are live, you know, publicly living the life. If that helps, especially with the the younger crowd, of saying, "Hey, here's people that are doing it, and they're happy. They don't regret things." You know that. And I, I always, people kind of get. In, I I hate the questions on regret and other things, but 
Then, then you look at somebody been do that been around for years and years and years as a celebrity, and you go, okay, they're happy, they're doing their mm-hmm. thing. I mean, what do you think? Is it, are the modern celebrities helping, hurting? What do you, where do you fit those in? I definitely think it helps. I really do. I think you know, especially even Seth came out and some, said something to the effect that that. They just didn't, he and his wife just didn't think it'd be a lot of fun to be parents, you know, and I think that some of those realities should be discussed very openly. For a lot of people, the process of parenting, it's not what they want, you know, so it's not like, oh, I just decided. They thought about it. They thought what kind of life they wanted, what did they want to experience, that kind of thing. And for public figures, they obviously also have chosen their work, their creative life has taken priority over the raising of a child. And I think that's something that's very important to pass on to younger people as they try to figure out what's important to them and what they want to do in their own lives. So it's how they prioritize it. What what does meaning and fulfillment really look like for me? So that's a way for us to look at how others are doing it with the spotlight on them. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I always, every time I see something on social media, I like cringe a little because I never know which way it's going to go. You know, like it's like, I'm not sure if this is a good story or a bad story. I, like I want to get off social media completely. That's one of my goals in life just to never be on there. <laughs> but I, I just, because of business and other things, I got to be there. Yeah, um, I understand. You and I connected a while back. I was working on some research for uh, my next book, The, the Chaffee Guide to Life and Money. And I, you had put a post out about a year ago, but I think it was originally two years ago talking about how people should market to the child-free community and really see the value of advertising to this community and working with it and, you know, really getting to it. And you and I exchanged a few emails about looking for marketing data. I'll be honest, we didn't find great at data. Like, I, no. you know, any other market, I could say subsection of people, I want to do a market analysis, I'll know who's there, how to reach them, and, like, went down the path, found a couple, like, high-level things, but nothing. We've actually hired a chief marketing officer to help on some of this because it's such a big issue. Great. But your point was, look, there's all these people, they got money, they want to buy stuff, just market them. Can you talk a little bit about that and what your thoughts were? Well, just that, that it's the missing a market segment that is, is growing and it, it, it can include people that they may describe themselves as someone who doesn't want kids now. Maybe they change your mind in, you know, 15 years. It, it doesn't matter because right now they don't have a kid. And, like, what, what are they wanting to buy? What do they buy? Are they aunties? You know, there's there was some of the only research that had some teeth to it, I think, came out around, was it 2016? Melanie Notkin was involved in working with some survey companies. And her MO is, you know, hey, there's a lot of, aunties and extended family members buying for kids like market the heck out of that at right right now during the holiday times you know we tend to when we don't have kids and or before we're married singles spend more on just what well, beauty products health products we travel more uh so i you know why are we not marketed to more i think we're back to pronatalism that's that the advertising industry still somehow thinks that the family meaning parents is what sells visually etc so uh it's it's a pickle i'm gonna be curious to see what you guys find out so i went there's a financial influencer conference and i went to them and i was talking about child-free folks and how most financial advice doesn't fit financial fit child-free we need to do different things and i said to them, i said look as far as i know i'm the first and only life and financial planning firm dedicated to child-free folks I'm like, I want like a hundred other firms doing that because it's a huge need. And by the way, you don't automatically become rich because of child free, but there are people with good money in the child free community. And I said, we should mark to it. We should do this thing. And I was at a different conference and somebody was trying to market it to the child free. And he was actually a parent himself. He actually happened to be in Tennessee, started his firm and his church started ostracizing him for serving child free people. Oh, you hate kids, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what the, (laughs) you know, like this makes no sense. And and I'm like, I come out of a research world and in the research world, they say if there's a gap in the research, the gap's sometimes there for a reason. When I looked at it from the financial world, I'm like, maybe the gap is there for a reason. But now that I'm into it, I'm like, no, like we need to figure out how to embrace the community and how to do it. But the challenges, and I'm just being transparent on my side, I've been trying to figure out how to market to child-free folks and I've done well, but even the biggest child-free influencers only got 100 150,000 followers, which is nothing out of the percentage of child-free people. 
and how do you reach them and how do you get there and uh, you know I, the one thing i did see this is silly but i saw it a few months ago they had a discussion they started showing pregnancy tests where people were happy for a negative yeah <laughs> yeah that's which sounds stupid but... no i've seen it yeah <laughs> brilliant it's a yeah. start <laughs> like yeah you know yeah. You know, we still buy Tide, you know, we don't just don't need it for our kids' soccer game. Like Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We buy what everybody else buys, except, you know, fewer toys. <laughs> well, I do think that marketing to this segment is another example of expanding the how you go after the market segment. It, and it can just be the child free, people who don't want them, but it can also include couples that can't have kids or are having trouble having kids or they're foreseeing that kids are not in their future. So it's more of a, a, a segment of people who do not have kids. Again, we don't have to go into the reason you don't have them and given and then, then your role comes in to like, okay, how do you foresee where y'all are going? And then you, you help them from there. And so there'll be different variations on never having kids to, well, we don't know we don't want them now and we want to plan for like seven years from now we might so let's you know financially plan for that so it's trying to have an expanded uh, view of the without children market is one certainly one thought that comes to mind that it, you know it speaks back to growing community which drove the special sisterhood is to find the commonalities of all of us you know that don't have no matter how we got there uh, i think it's an important conversation well, and I think that's part of the reason why this, you know, we're recording in December and we're at the end of like the social media fight over the dinks and like the, hey, I this is my, my dink life is like and I'm enjoying it and like people getting all fired up on social media for it. You know, then people go, well, this dinks a new term. No, that's been around forever. Okay, yeah, like that, exactly. you know. Yeah. I, I do think for my specific marketing, I'm helping people who don't have kids and never plan on having kids because right. your financial plan, if you think you might, is still a standard plan, so I, I'm drawing lines. So I say, mm -hmm. I said child free and permanently childless folks. I see. You know, if you're still mm -hmm. yeah. debating, yeah. I, there's no perfect. But there I is wonder no perfect, if, for sure. Yeah, I wonder if the term is part of the reason why we have marketing issues. Whether it's dinks, child free, childless, whatever it is, if you Google, you know, so for example, I'm just using my example. If people know that somebody exists that serves people like them from child free folks, they come to my website, they're great. But what you say is, I didn't know to, to search for child free and wealth, <laughs> you know, like, or, you know, financial planning without kids because financial right. planning without kids could be like the empty nest versus the, right. you know, never having it. So I wonder if we're almost stuck in a Google search term problem, of, <laughs> you know, because as a community, we still fight over the terms. I mean, right. maybe that's part of our problem. Well, even dinks, you know, double income, no kids, that doesn't mean they're necessarily child free. It just means they might, they're double income, no kids right now. <laughs> I mean, so I, I, yeah, it's been around a long time and it went through a period of dinks and then it was green inclined, no kids. It was ganks for a while. And, you know, the media just riffs on all this stuff. So I, I don't have an answer for you, but I think you're, you're onto something with the algorithms and finding the right terminology, but yeah. <laughs> One day, and it, I don't know, for me, I would like to see a day where we don't even have to have the terms anymore because why, are we, why do we start by describing people by their reproductive desires and status? You know, that's pronatalist in and of itself. Uh, I would like to see that not be the, at the top of the list, but uh, that doesn't help, you know, businesses who have the child-free set want to have that child-free customer base. But I think that's a sociological phenom that would show some progress if we're once sort of fixated on reproduction first and policy wasn't focused on reproduction first, et cetera. So um, I'd like to see some of that change in my lifetime. I think you're on the right page. Uh, Katie Seppi's over on the child less side a little bit more, and she's been trying to say, uh, hey, maybe we can get a word expert, I forget the actual mm -hmm. technical term for it, to figure out a word that is for us, but is not less or missing the other part. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's a great question I have no clue answer on, but I'm like, please find that answer. Like, you know, that's a great one. You did kind of clue me in, and I'm gonna ask you kind of one last question. What do you want the next five years to look like for the child-free community. If you like look in your crystal ball, what would be the ideal future for us? 
Well, I think I think I wrote about this last year. I do an annual child-free trending piece, and <clears throat> what I would like to see, I mean, it's talked about more these days as a movement, and I have questioned that. I think it is in the process of becoming a movement because we have we are growing as a collective and and we have community but until we we mobilize and go after we campaign or go after something i think that's what will grow a movement so i would like to see more people in the workplace be able to influence decision makers to make policy that is is that is equitable that it doesn't start with parents and children as it's as the center and to make actual change there that will then really change culture in the workplace. So that's what social and cultural change, you know, in the end, it looks like it's an actual thing that's different or that's made rather than just keep talking about it and the stereotypes and this back and forth online and what social media does and the media, you know, the media gets onto topics and then rings them dry and then we move on to the next one. It's all good, I think, in the big scheme of things, but for actual change, I'd like us just to be able to grow stronger as a collective to go after things like policy. So that's that's what I'd like to see in the next five years, even if it's just the little seeds of stuff. We could start to read about it. People who are actually doing it, companies actually getting it, that kind of thing. And there are some starting to move in that direction. You know, like there was a I was working with a tech firm that their language was very well structured around spouses and not necessarily yeah. kids, parents, family structure. Yes. Like and they had benefits yes. no matter whether you're married or not. Like you're seeing some Excellent. of that at the edges. You, you do. know, and new yeah. legacy institutes working on this. Great group for that if you have if you're interested in it. I think you're right on. You know, we, we are at that point. I I just we need to come out of the shadows, I think is the way I feel about it. Mm -hmm. And I had somebody who was working at a university in the South and was trying to set up a like a student activity group type, you know, like where they have like the they have the groups for anything, you know, the business club, the LGBT club, the parents club. Tried setting up a child free club and the university wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like you have seven other clubs just like the, uh, you have a you have a new parents club. Why can't you we're not asking for any money. Like we just want to have it as a thing. And I was like, really? But that's an example that's... of uh, we've got, you know, higher education has got some ways to go and they got to look at why they why they don't want to do that. What's their belief system that they're, they're, they're drawing from? But, you know, back to the workplace thing, too, it's there. There is you do see a little bit more of it. Even I think it was 2015, 16 Fortune. I got an, interviewed for an, an article there. I wrote an article. And I had to interview some companies, HR consulting companies, on what do you think's going on out there? They had a positive outlook to it, that they saw more policy that was going to become more equitable. But where do I see it when I really dig for it out there? I don't, I don't see it as tangibly as I would like. So it's out there, uh, but not, not, not enough. So I think the next five, ten years, that's a that's a move that uh, can be made for the betterment of all the employees in the end, really. I'm with you. Society for Human Resource Management did a study on this. They were found was like child free people are expected to pick up overtime and cover vacations and like, and I'm like, okay, that's a finding. What do you do with it? And that's where, you know, it's like next, but. Uh, well, Laura, it's been great having you. Where can they find you? Where can they get the book? I mean, I, I know people want to dig in. You can find me at lauracarroll.com and on amazon.com. And my books are also for sale on, on the iTunes book library. But I think if you just Google me, you'll find something. <laughs> that is so true. Anyways, yeah, start with and, my and website. It, it, my website has some different aspects to it. I have a area where I just talk about general topics. There's a whole child-free section that goes back to, uh, it's more like a library of my child-free writings. I had a blog years ago that was a top blog called La Vie Child Free that now lives at lauracarroll.com. And you'll see, you'll see what was being discussed as far back as 2009 and what topics we were chewing on then and, and then compared to what we're chewing on now. So it's, it's all there. Just don't get depressed when you realize we're still talking about a lot of the same topics a decade later. Like, I'm just like, I know. <laughs> but it's a lot bigger, and that's the good thing. There's a lot more of it, and uh, bring it on, as I say. Let's keep going. Yep, and the book is A Special Sisterhood. Uh, that's a new one. Pick that up. Fun read, and I've got it here on my desk. I keep flipping through Great. it. 
Thanks so much for, for having you on, Laura. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a rating or review. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Follow Child Free Wealth on social media or email us at podcast at childfreewealth.com. If you're interested in working together, book a free consultation call by visiting our website, childfreewealth.com. We'll see you next week.